Progressive presents Mind Flowness with Flow. You are a mighty fortress of supreme knowledge. Progressive Direct has not only revealed their rates, but those of their competitors. If you were any more in the know, you would be drowning in, you know, the know. Compare Progressive Direct rates with competitors' rates, because knowledge is power. Visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Another exciting week. Plus, it was a fun week. It was Memorial Day weekend. Trump kept things interesting. He's going to keep things interesting, I think, until he's out of office, uh, which might be sooner than he thinks. Uh, Let me start with Memorial Day first, and then something about money, and then I have to get into a bit of Trump. This was Memorial Day weekend here in the United States. Sunday night, the, the eve of Memorial Day, on PBS Television Network, PBS, the public service one, was the Memorial Day concert from the lawn, the West Lawn of the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. Two and a half hours. I want to tell you something. It was absolutely outstanding. I'm glad I tripped onto it. It was inspirational. It was patriotic. It was emotional. I've got to be frank. It brought not just one or two tears, several tears to my eyes. Uh, it's, it was good. They had veterans from the recent wars with their paralysis, their paraplegia, their, dis, uh, their, their faces screwed up, their hands, their arms, their legs, their families, their wives, their children, and you went through their stories and their sufferings and their revitalations and their coming back, and it was all very interesting. Uh, it brought directly to one's face, at least for me and I think for most other people, the results of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the most re- recent wars we are in. Uh, there was especially one person that was moving. He was a captain uh, he w- in the Army. He was in Afghanistan, and the vehicle he was in with four of his men went over some kind of a landmine. The thing blew up. His four men were killed. He was beat up pretty badly. He lost a leg. He was in a coma for 47 days. He's a paraplegic, confined to a wheelchair the rest of his life. It, he had to learn to do everything over again, including talking. It's been about four years, and I don't know how many surgeries, 40-some-odd surgeries, since his accident at war. And there he was, dressed in his uniform in a wheelchair with his lovely wife and his three children. He sang with two professional singers, but he sang. He sang a patriotic American song, the name I can't remember, Uh his enunciation, his ability to sing, about 75%. This guy was terrific at 75%. Even though the top half of his body moved, his hands and his arms were sort of screwed up and crunched up, and you bled for the guy. That's where I cried the hardest. This guy was saying, that's okay, I made it, I'm here, and I'm proud to be here, and I'm happy to be here. Uh it hits us hard. With this, the show showed me, at least, what's happening over there uh, right up front again, uh, what's happening to the minds, the bodies, and the families of our fighting men and women. Uh, I wish everyone could have seen it. It was a touching moment. It was an eye-opening moment. Now let's talk about money in this country. Tens of millions of forgotten Americans. There are tens of millions of forgotten Americans here that the United States economy has left behind. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the middle class, the little bit that's left. You know, 30, 40 years ago, we had a strong middle class in this country. People were working. The men were making good money. Uh, Kids were going to college. Uh, New cars every two or three years. Family homes. It was wonderful. But then we started losing our middle class, and today it's down to next to nothing. A recent study indicated that nearly one-half 
of the people in the United States are unable to cover an unexpected $400 expense. In other words, you're sitting home on a Friday night watching television, and all of a sudden you need $400 for something, you got to pay it right away. Good luck. You ain't got $400, all right? You haven't got $400. And the rest of the study indicated that two-thirds, two-thirds of the people uh, in this country, two-thirds of the American citizenry, lives paycheck to paycheck, and I'm sure many of you can understand that. Now we talk about, I want to talk about, the millennials. These are these young kids who are out there now, young kids. I'm 81, so I call them young. But they're adults. They're in their 20s and 30s. They're referred to as millennials. 80% of them want to buy, okay, a home. They're getting married or they're living with somebody. They want their own home. The all-American thing, everyone wants to buy a home and buy it as quickly as possible. Could do it yesterday, can't do it today. Uh, Why? Because another recent study showed or indicated that 68% of the millennials, I repeat, 68% of the millennials have less than $1,000 saved towards the purchase of a new home. That can't even cover the down payment. The study further showed that the balance of the 100% didn't have a down payment for anything at all. Not good. Sad. This country screwed up. This is, you know, the 1% are getting fatter. Trump's people are going to get even fatter as tax bill goes through. Uh, It won't benefit the 99%. Uh, And this is the way it is in this country. It's got to change. We got we got to take the country back from the rich guys. They took it over. Uh, amazing, absolutely amazing, and it will come back. Uh, but you got to take it back. Now I'm not saying revolution or anything, but you got to take it back. Let's think, people. Use your brains. Want to talk now about Donald Trump a little bit? You got to talk about Donald Trump. I got sick of talking about Donald Trump, but now you have to talk about Donald Trump because when he's in this country, every day it's something new. When he was out of the country, it wasn't too bad. Let's start with this. His recent trip to Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, Rome to see the Pope, uh, to to the NATO conference. Uh, He says, Trump says, a huge success, a big success. Everyone else says, a failure. What the hell is this guy looking at? You know, either he believes this, because this guy's got mental problems. I say this with all due respect. He may believe that everything he does is terrific. And so when he went to these meetings, everything he did he thought was terrific. So when he leaves, he said, I did good. Whereas in reality, he's screwing everything up and doesn't realize it. So maybe he's lying. I don't know which one it is. Anyhow. He sucked up, he sucked up to the, our enemies, and he defecated on our allies. The Arabs loved him. Saudi Arabia, are you kidding me? They gave him a gold medal. I can't recall the last time one of our presidents got a gold medal from an Arab nation, all right? And then you saw him on television. They were all lined up, the sheiks, and there he is. He's in the middle of them in a suit. And he's dancing their dance. They're jumping up and down, the men. And they all had black swords in their hands, and they were shaking them to the sky. And there he was, laughing with a big smile, doing the same thing. They weren't our friends, the Saudi, the Saudi people. And then he goes to Europe to see our NATO allies, our G7 allies. And he was an unhappy camper. And he made everybody else at the meeting an unhappy camper, the prime ministers and presidents of the other nations. Uh, Whereas he was, oh, boy, this is fun, and I love you guys in Saudi Arabia. He embarrassed our NATO ally friends publicly, and he behaved, in my opinion, like a thug, 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 that's the word, thug, pushing people around to get in the front of a line to take a picture You saw it. It was on television. Merkel said yesterday, Angela Merkel said yesterday, the United States cannot be dependent upon. 
We are responsible for our own fate. Isn't that terrible? Everyone up to Trump's time has worked hard to put together a group, a confederacy in effect, if I may use that term, of allies, of countries that were going to look out for each other's asses, the strongest country being the United States, the country needed most by all of them if there's trouble, the country whose reputation for military might has kept the bad guys away from these nations. But what does Trump do at the meeting? He doesn't say the appropriate words that has always been said, I'm here, the United States is here, we're for you, we're backing you up, don't worry. Sad, wrong. I want to talk about Trump and this Russian investigation. Let me tell you something. This Russian investigation is only the beginning. It's opening Pandora's box. What's going to come out in the end, (laughs) it'll have something to do with Russian collusion and the Russians tapping into or hacking into our political system. But there's more that's going to come out, stuff that's going to bring Donald Trump down, Jared his son-in-law down, and it's going to do with money, money. Uh, Watch and see. And so I believe that this investigation that started and this wonderful, the worst thing this guy did, Trump, was firing Comey because now he's got a real hot one uh, running this investigation, Uh, Mueller, uh, Robert Mueller. And this is no guy to screw around with. He's going to dig, and if he comes up with something, he's going to nail everyone to the wall. So I view, I view this investigation as to the as the road to the end of Trump's presidency. All right, down the road, not today, not tomorrow, but within his presidency, maybe within a year, that soon. It's inevitable. Now I want to talk about Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. What I'm going to share with you, I shared six months ago on either this show, my blo- or in my Black Talk radio show, uh, somewhere. I wrote about it someplace. And three months ago, I said it again. Uh, I'm one of the few people that picked up on this, I think, if I'm right. I don't know if I'm right. And what I'm going to accuse, if I am accusing the president and Jared about, I, I say allegedly, because what the hell do I know sitting here in Key West? But this is what I dug up, but this is where I think this thing's going. But allegedly, uh, you got to follow the money. Follow the money, just like in the Nixon impeachment. Follow the money. Because perhaps we're going to find that this whole mess starts with money laundering in Israel. Okay? And then the money that's being laundered goes through the bank Putin controls in Moscow. And from there, it goes to other European banks and then to United States banks. And who's involved in some of these parceling of the money, transactions, etc.? Perhaps, allegedly, Trump and Jared Kushner. Watch and see. Follow the money. Now I want to talk about Trump and Saudi Arabia and Blackstone. Now, you know who Trump is. He's our president. You know who Saudi Arabia is, great Arab nation. These are wonderful people. We should love them. Don't forget, the Saudis gave us $4 a gallon gasoline. 17 of the terrorists on the airplanes on 9-11 were residents, citizens of Saudi Arabia. Uh, So they're our friends. They're always our friends, these guys. And Blackstone I want to talk about. Now, I don't know if you ever heard about Blackstone. Blackstone is a contractor of troops. These are not Army people. They may be retired Army people. But these are citizens, civilians, who go to work for a company called Blackstone and then become soldiers. And the United States pays them to go fight battles someplace for them. And other countries, too, also in warlords in Central America and in Colombia. It's a big business. And uh, they do a lot of things. Now, Blackstone screwed up a couple of years ago. So today, the name of the company may not be Blackstone. It may be a subsidiary or uh, another corporation. Uh, but they're in there renting their soldiers to us. Now, 
you never heard of this or you rarely hear about those who also serve who contract out. This invisible army. A Peter J. Woolley, a couple of days ago in the Wall Street Journal, wrote an interesting article. And I want to just pop out a couple of sentences from what he said. He said, they aren't counted as boots on the ground or considered veterans when they return home. When wounded or killed, they aren't saluted by the president or interred at Arlington Cemetery. They are the thousands of contractors working for the Pentagon or State Department, et cetera, et cetera. These, they work for private companies, and these companies are responsible for recruitment, training, and compensation. The government is freed from having to offer veterans affairs care or costly or other costly benefits but the biggest advantage to Washington, and this is very true, and this is why you probably didn't know about this, is that they are invisible to the public. And this has been since 2001. You see, our presidents always want to say that they sent a certain number, but no more, of the American military to go fight in foreign lands. Because when the dead come back, uh, they keep the numbers down. They fail to tell us how... The State Department or CIA is paying these contracting soldiers who go over there and die also. Let me give you the numbers so you understand how big this thing is. Since 2001, okay, uh, 6,750 contractors, no, I'm sorry, American soldiers have been killed in Afghanistan, 6,750, whereas 3,200 were killed in Iraq. I've got it wrong. Excuse me again. 6,750 since 2001 American soldiers died in Afghanistan and Iraq. 3,200 contractor soldiers died also in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, on Memorial Day, we don't honor these people. Remember that. We do not honor them. They don't exist as far as our government is concerned. Even though they're fighting shoulder to shoulder with our military in these foreign lands. Uh, these contractors make a lot of money doing this. They pay big money for the ability to provide soldiers to America to fight who don't wear our uniform. Okay. Now, at the end of 2007, there were 166,000 American troops serving in Iraq, 166,000. There were also another 155,000 contractors, okay? In other words, for every one military, there was almost one contracting soldier. You never heard, that's twice as many people as we should have had fighting over there. We weren't told, okay? We weren't told. Um... Right now, we got out of Iraq, remember? Well, we're back in Iraq. There's about 5,000 troops in Iraq today, United States troops. And there are also 4,000 contractors. Pretty close number, isn't it? That comes almost to 10,000. Uh, and that's, that's the way it goes in Afghanistan. Uh, it's just the way it is. I, I, and you've got to understand that these guys make big money. These contracting companies like Blackstone make a shitload of money. Now, let me tie all this together for you. Uh, Hillary and Trump regarding Saudi Arabia during the campaign. Trump said about Hitler, Hillary, rather, and I quote, you, ta you talk about women and women's rights. So these are people that push gays off bridges. These are people who kill women and treat women horribly, and yet you take their money. He was mocking her and calling her to task for taking donations from Saudi Arabia to her Clinton Foundation. Okay, Last week, Donald Trump, this is only six months since the election, Donald Trump's in Saudi Arabia, and he's sucking up to the Arabs big time. I don't have to tell you, you saw it with your own eyes on television. And at the end, what happened? A $110 billion arms deal right away. My God, that's terrific. The Arabs got the money. They need top flight of military equipment. The best in the world is the United States. He arranged 
Trump arranged for it to be sold to them. In the meantime, something else happened, and we very little about this in the news. I talked about this last week. The Saudi Arabia and the Arab Emirates made a donation of one hundred million dollars. A donation of one. They got one hundred ten billion in arms. They made a donation of one hundred million dollars as a gift to an Ivanka Trump inspired not for profit. She had suggested we need something to empower women worldwide, and this not-for-profit's been established. And even though she doesn't have a part of it, they gave, in her honor, $100 million they donated to this empowering women group. Now comes a third part of the deal that I only picked up on today, and it's this Blackstone again, the contracting company for the soldiers. They do a lot of things. Turns out that Blackstone is one of the largest lenders to Kushner's businesses, one of the largest lenders to Gerard Kushner's businesses, son-in-law to Donald Trump. Since 2013, they have loaned him $400 million to finance deals, $400 million to finance deals, okay? Now we're going to do infrastructure in this country, new, fix our roads, fix our bridges, new schools. We've let this go for years, for decades. It's anticipated that over a 10-year period, if we do the job right, the United States is going to spend $3.7 trillion fixing up, correcting the infrastructure. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, Blackstone, Trump's come up with this idea. Probably Blackstone told him. Why have the government do these things? It costs money, increases taxes for people. Why don't you let the private sector pay for it, not the public sector? We are private sector, Blackstone, okay? And what we'll do is we'll lease the roads and the bridges, etc., from whoever owns them, the county, the state, the federal government, and we'll repair them. The lease will be for 30 to 50 years, and it will be our responsibility to repair and maintain them. And as a result thereof, we can charge tolls. That's where the money is, in the tolls. I know. I, it's a gold mine. I've been in Italy many times in the past few years. Italy does it. They gave all their, their, their highways, major highways, to private concerns, and Beautiful highways, I've got to tell you. Beautiful bridges. Sometimes they don't even repair the road. 50 or 100 feet away, they build a new parallel road that's even more beautiful with a better bridge than the other road has. But they make the money up in tolls. However, they keep raising the tolls. And it's become so expensive that my Italian friends were all looking for back roads, side roads to travel to avoid the tolls because the tolls got that burdensome. Uh, there's another thing that comes into this. In Trump's budget that he's proposed for this year, there is $200 billion he claims is going to come in from the private sector to do what I just told you. We're going to start doing infrastructure, though with private money, not public funds. We're going to save you, you uh, money or my taxpayer uh, friends here. Blackstone is probably going to be a favored contractor in this deal. One reason being, Blackstone contributed $400 million, $400 million in political donations to Trump PACs in the last election. $400 million. I'm done with Donald Trump. How's that? Now I'm going to move over to Assad. Little Donald Trump in this. Assad. Assad in Syria. I'm going to talk about crematoriums where you burn bodies. History repeats itself. Hitler and Auschwitz. Remember German efficiency? They were killing the Jews in so many huge numbers that the corpses were piling up. They couldn't dig enough mass graves, you know, and put a couple of hundred bodies in there, cover them with lime, throw the dirt on top. It, it took too long. They were killing faster than they could bury, faster than they could dispose of the bodies. So what did Hitler do? Efficient man. He had crematoriums built at Eschwitz and other concentration camps, and they put 
the bodies, the dead Jews, and the, the boilers and burn them up. Ashes easier to dispose of than the whole body. Now comes, 70 years later, Sirius Assad. He doesn't kill by the millions. He's not as big as Hitler. But he has killed by the hundreds of thousands his own people. Okay? Uh, now, he had the same problem Hitler did. He's killing all his people. The bodies are piling up. Can't dispose of the corpses. Corpses fast enough. So he has a prison. It's called Sedenaya, S-E-D-N-A-Y-A, military prison. Sedenaya, military prison. Just so happened, he was killing most of these people at this prison. So he says, hey, Hitler did it this way. I can do it too. So he built a crematorium onto the jail. Sedenaya, military prison, now has a huge crematorium. And he he puts the he kills the people that are very efficient, and then he puts the bodies into the crematoriums and burns them up right away. Uh, <laughs> nice guy. Uh, note also that as he kills these people, there's just like with Hitler, there were no judicial proceedings. You were a Jew, you were sent. No judge said you got to die. You died. With him and his. These are his own people, but they're opposed to him, or they're not the really proper sect. Uh, and what does he do? He just sends them off to jail. No judge says you're going to die. Now, Assad, here's where I get a little upset. Assad is supported by Saudi Arabia and Russia. We support the United States, the rebels who are opposing and fighting Assad, the ones that are getting killed all the time in those boilers or in those crematoriums. Uh we have men on the ground there, soldiers, men and women, who have advisors and trainers. They're getting killed and wounded by the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, who has a piece of their air force over there and is bombing every day, and the Russians. All right? Now, Saudi Arabia is our friend. We just gave them this big $110 billion military deal. We're going to sell them weapons, the best weapons in the world, that they're going to use a year from now that are going to end up killing some of our people in Syria who are helping the rebels on the other side. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. How can we, the United States, be friends with a friend and supporter of a man such as Assad? That's what Lewis thinks. Uh... Interesting story. Remember Roy Schneider in Jaws? <laughs> he saw the shark up close, and he said, and I quote, we're going to need a bigger boat, unquote. I laugh when I say it. You have to smile, too, if you saw the movie. He just turned around and very calmly said, we're going to need a bigger boat. Well, a similar situation occurred this past week in Australia. A 73-year-old man was out fishing. He was fishing in a, something a little bit bigger than a rowboat. And all of a sudden, a white shark, nine feet long, 440 pounds, jumped in the boat, <laughs> knocked the fisherman over, did something to his arm. There's blood all over the place. The fisherman hand, ends up on his hands and knees, eyeball to eyeball with the shark, a white shark. Uh, he scooted, the man scooted to the bow of the boat. Not much room in this boat. Uh he describes his experience as, and I quote, just a mundane thing. Uh, the fisherman survived. The shark died. Had to be a hell of a scary uh, experience. There's a crock dial. Croc oh, oh, my show's 90 seconds left. So I can't tell you about the crocodile on the Key West golf course. I'll save it for next week. It goes with the Latin story about the man, Lefty Scavola, and how he lost his right hand. And if you put your hand in the bush or in the water, the croc's going to make you a Lefty Scavola. But I'll save that story for next week. I thank you for joining me this evening. I enjoy doing the show. I, I appreciate your, your joining in with me. Uh, I do every day now, I'm into my third month, a Facebook video. Facebook video, two or three minutes. I say whatever comes to mind, one item, that's all. It's live. Uh, watch it if you can. Uh, it's Key West Lou. I go by the name of Key West Lou for it. You have to be my friend. If you're not my friend, ask to make Key West Lou your friend, and we'll get this whole thing going so you can watch it. I believe you will enjoy it. Thank you again for joining me tonight. I look forward to being with you 
next week.